to a relationship between economics and capitalism and other social systems such as democracy and so forth is absolutely fundamental to not only to our material well-being, but to our peace and security. The dominant par paradigm in economics, is it going to empower the further breakdown, the further sort of empowerment of authoritarianism and nationalism? Or is it going to empower a more creative response to the, the, the system breakdown? You know, there's the, the enormous progress and the enormous benefits that economics and capitalism have brought, but there's also the, the huge downsides. Does that bring us into levels of societal collapse and violence before we can come out of it and learn that we need to have a, a different accommodation between capitalism and society? We have to return to our roots. And returning to our roots means returning to values of empathy, of concern, of community, that we can get through this and find the way forward together. I think there's three reasons that I'd point to about why, in my mind, economics matters. I think the first one is about material well-being. So economics is about material well-being. You know, how do we, how do we improve our, our our material standards of living? And so the first thing, as I say, material not only is economic appointment for material well-being in itself, but also what that enables. So in, what it enables for a society in terms of the rule of law, in terms of education in terms of citizen participation and so forth. So I think when you look at history since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, where you know, economics in its current form really took off, you'll see that the increases in material well-being that capitalism has enabled have been enormous and have underpinned enormous human progress. And if you measure that progress by those things of um, the rule of law and, and education and so forth. Yeah. Um, it hasn't been perfect, of course, um, but material well-being and improvement of material well-being is the first thing I think I'd point to. The second reason why economics matters is because it deals with issues of power and inequality. And those are central to how society is, is structured. Um, maybe we'll come back to that again later. Um, and the third thing I think why economics matters is because it it lays an, an overview, if you like, of how we view ourselves, what it is to, means to be human and what it means to live a good life. And so economics has a particular view on those questions, you know, and what it means to be a good life, to live a good life in terms of you know, achieving material success, uh, gaining a certain level of income and, and wealth and so forth. And, and I think that's gone to in in our current system, you know that that value system which underpins the current model of economics has really become the dominant value system within society, and that impacts on all of us. Um, and I will argue, maybe during some of the other questions, that it's now impacting on us in severely detrimental ways. For this one, I'd like to, to respond to the term economic science, uh, because I'm a scientist by background. Uh, my, my background is PhD in, in atomic physics and quantum physics. So um, the idea of economics being a science, I think is something that's really interesting to reflect on. And um, because I think even in my own sort of journey through science and through life, you know, the idea of scientism, that science is something that gives you an ultimate truth, you know, that allows black and white thinking, that enables, that is focused very much on what can be measured, you know, and prioritizes and, and valorizes what can be measured to the exclusion or devaluations of things which can't. And then the whole idea of objective reality. You know. So those are all things that are being questioned. And certainly, you know, going back to Niels Bohr and quantum mechanics, the, 
those were questioned um, a century ago already uh, about the, the object, objective sort of nature of science. That doesn't undermine the truth of what we, what we find in science, but it does put it in perspective in terms of, you know, um, the role of science, science playing a role in, in, in knowledge generation that isn't the only means of gaining knowledge. So those are reflections to begin with on science. You know? And if you come then to economic science, I think, I think economics has very much taken on board the mantle of a science that has objective knowledge that gives black and white thinking and so forth. And I think that is, has been dangerous. Yeah. I think economics is much more and, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle ground between you know, objective measurement and, as I say, dealing with issues of power and inequality, being enmeshed very much in po politics um, and other gender, other types of, of issues within society. And um, I think it's, it's very questionable to, to use the term economic science. Of course, what used to be talked about was political economy, you know, which, which recognized the fundamental political nature of economic debate, the fundamental you know, rooting of economic thinking within issues of power and inequality, of justifying inequality, what types of inequalities are justified, and so forth. So I would, I would question, and I think that is one of the issues when we come to, you know, does the existing system deserve to continue? I think that underpinning of, of claiming absolute truth and of claiming objective reality, um, quite apart from all of the other social systems, such as, as I say, as politics and, and gender and so on, technology and so on. And um, I think that's highly problematic. I think for the term economic engineering, that's an interesting term too, right? because again, we're, we're taking the, you know, the language of engineering as being objective and again, something that you know, is based in, in measurement and science and so forth. And again, that's questionable. Um, and, and I think when it comes to the term economic engineering, I think this has been interesting from the discussions within Nike. You know, and engineering conjures up images of, of building something, you know, of, of designing and building. You know? Whereas I think an awful lot of policymaking and, and economics at the moment is about trying to retain an, an, an existing structure. It's much less about engineering as it, than it is about system maintenance or system restoration. You know? um, and again, I think given the problems that we're facing in terms of climate change, given the knowledge that we've gained in terms of alternative framings for economics, feminist economics, for example, um, the, the, I think the idea that we can maintain an economic system in equilibrium with the, the, the scale of the changes that are happening in the environment around us, I think is untenable. So economic engineering, great. I would applaud the term if it was applied to how do we re-engineer the structures that we currently have? How do we rethink the ideas that underpin it? But I, I think much more of that is needed for to, to justify the term economic engineering for public current policy making. This is a fascinating question. And from my own from my own perspective, it's probably the most important question of all eight. You know? And in the book that I'd written, Disordered Minds, I that book was really written around the for, for me, the recognition that the tyrants of the 20th century, Mao and Stalin and Hitler and so forth, had emerged out of the fissures, the failures of, the econo of capitalism in the early 20th century. Uh, the inequalities, the vast inequalities that were, were ex existent at that time, out of that, the, you know, the ideological struggle between capitalism and, and communism, which at root, it's interesting, yeah? at root, they were both aimed at the same thing. They were both aimed at material well-being rather than a larger framing of 
you know, maybe there were aspects of it, but a larger framing of gender equality and, and human flourishing beyond material, you know, and not beyond material well-being and so forth. And um, neither of them could be described as spiritual movements in terms of, uh, you know, a movement of human consciousness beyond, you know, a, a focus on material. And by, by that, spiritualism, I don't mean that not, that's not necessarily something that's supernatural or something that's, you know, by spiritual, I mean something that's much more about you know, how we want to live our lives, you know, the, what is the impulse within ourselves for, for our own personal and societal development. You know? um, that, and as I said, words like love come into that conversation, you know, love and development and empathy and so forth. So how do we build a society that is based on, on fundamental human values that we see from our moment of birth? Um, so neither capitalism nor um, communism were based on a, on an ideology that went beyond much beyond material growth. So when I say what role does economics play in society, I think it has been shown to, to play an, an almost a foundational role in shaping society, in shaping our view of ourselves, and in, in enabling or containing the pathologies within society. And by pathology, I mean greed and violence. So capitalism, by enabling enormous inequalities, can empower individuals and movements that are, you know, that resort to violence, that resort to, to greed and so forth. And we've seen that in the in the 20th century. So I think our our framing of economics, the relationship between economics and capitalism and other social systems such as democracy and so forth is absolutely fundamental to not only to our material well-being, but to our peace and security. Economics, the kind of positive economics has become like a de detached amoral science, if you want to use that word. And I think many economists revel in that status that uh, you know, it's not their job to uh, bring in ethical considerations. It's purely to look at uh, market outcomes and uh, the, the, the role of the state and, and uh, the interaction of the two and to produce objective analytical advice based on that and not sort of confuse it with these uh, ethical dimensions and, and issues. And do you think that economics can integrate ethics or can it uh, reform to have a more holistic approach to thinking about people uh, and not just outcomes of markets and economic performance? I think it's a fundamental mischaracterization to say that economics is currently amoral. I mean, the, the economic system, the framing of the system absolutely is imbued with value, is imbued with values. Yep. Uh, and those values are that certain things are externalities, certain things are not counted. Mm -hmm. yeah? Certain things are valued over other things. Yeah. And um, so, you know, looking after other people's wealth is, is valued more highly than being a nurse or being a teacher uh, and as reflected in wages. And um, so it's a fundamental, and, you know, I think it was, in one sense, it was a tactic for many in, on, on neoliberalism to paint it as an as an amoral system with no values, yeah, you know, as a system that ran by itself, and this goes back again to the economic science, on almost like rules of of nature, yeah, you know? it's nonsense. And we hear a lot also developing this idea a bit further uh, the the cult of evidence based policy making is uh, actually gaining ground, gaining traction, and it's. It's kind of dangerous to go in this direction because evidence, again, it's like your discussion of, you know, what is science, what is engineering, um, but what is evidence is uh, really important because it's, I get the impression that if we only look at data, the past data, uh, and that is what we think of as evidence, then it's almost like the belief is that we know everything there is to know. 
And uh, when thinking about the future, we just have to base it on extrapolation based on what's already happened. But it, the, the nature of the systems that we're looking at are not like this. And so evidence-based policy, everybody agrees with that term and say, yeah, of course we need evidence-based policy, but it can actually restrict the field of view in a way that's quite uh, dangerous. Absolutely. And I think that's, the way I think of that is the most important thing is your framing. Mm -hmm. And then you, the evidence that's permissible within that framing or the evidence that you then think is, is essential within that framing. Right? So this is very important at the moment, for example, in terms of system transitions. So the transition towards low carbon energy system or you know, for climate change or transitions in, in, in energy or, or whatever, or um, transport and so on and agriculture. There was a comment at a, a meeting I was at recently where uh, the comment was made about evaluation you know, and current methods of evaluation, which of course is gathering the data within a framing, which is a static system, for maximizing the efficiency of that system. Yeah? But that method of evaluation and you know, then assessing projects you know, within that framing will actually be detrimental to progress. <laughs> yeah? It'll stop the necessary progress we absolutely have to make. Yeah? Because the framing will be you haven't you haven't increased productivity, you haven't you know, got the number of whatever it is. Whereas what you really need in an evaluation of system transition is the learnings that you're having. Are you proceeding towards the, the goal? You don't know what the path is going to be, so therefore you can't put the, the data in place in many cases to measure that. Yeah? So, so as I say, that's, that's an example for me about evidence-based of course, you want evidence based, but it, but as you say, what counts as evidence absolutely depends on the framing within which you 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 assess that. I think the answer to this question I'm going to link to the answer to the previous one, yeah. and what counts as evidence, and I think. One of the one data point of evidence is the rage that there is in so many people in so many different countries around the world. Yeah. And I think that points to um, what uh, you know, in the, the project uh, on the deep institutional innovation for sustainability and human development, we're looking at in, in terms of multiple system breakdown. Yeah. Not only is economics failing, not only is the framing of economics failing because of, for various reasons, of the externalities and so forth, the inequalities that are currently um, existent, the power imbalances and so forth, but other social institutions too are breaking down. Um, and so I think it's almost when you, when you frame things like this, when you think we are in this moment of, of multiple institutional breakdown, what does that mean for individuals then? I think what it means for individuals, and people may have experienced this during the pandemic, and I think when you get an individual experience of it, it's almost like you know you, you reframe how you see everything, all the other, the other enraged people around the world, huh? because when it impacts you, if something impacts you and you think this is absolutely, you know, I'm furious about this, I'm not going to vote for these people again, I'm not going to, you know. They've lost, in my, my eyes, they've lost credibility because of what they've done. Yeah? These very personal experiences of, of rage and you know, loss of faith and expertise. Yeah? If you think about how multiple institutions are breaking down and how millions of people can be individually impacted in very different ways. Yeah? It could be on an economic issue. It could be you know, in the, what's been happening in the, in the church, for example. And uh, um, um, it could be on any issue, but that rage is something that's common right across the board. You'll, you'll find this welling up of rage when these systems are breaking down. And then you see what happens in response. And this is what we see. There are two currents in response. Yeah? One of those currents we call, I'm calling the destructive stream. And it's the rise of authoritarianism. Yeah? It's the rise of Trump and you know, all of the xenophobic nationalism and so forth. Yeah? 
So we call this the destructive stream because it's bringing us further from democracy and the, you know, the protections we need, the thinking we need to get out of it, to deal with this system breakdown. But the other current that's happening that gives hope is the current of the creative response. So all of the, the movements around the world that are demanding you know, greater you know, rethinking of, of economics, greater equality, you know, greater gender equality, the Me Too movement and so forth. Huh? The peace movement that's been there for decades huh? and about. So I think in this age of rage, there is the, these two currents. Huh? And the question for economics is which one is it going to empower? Which of uh, the dominant par paradigm in economics, is it going to empower the further breakdown, the further sort of empowerment of authoritarianism and nationalism? Or is it going to empower a more creative response to the, the, the system breakdown? I think it's an interesting question. Huh? And, and I would reframe it. I, I'm, I'm not going to answer should they be accountable for their advice. Uh, but I think they should definitely be held accountable for their ideas. And I think there, is, there are sufficient grounds for questioning some of the fundamental ideas that underpin the current economic paradigm. So the, I'd, I'd start first with the idea of, of inequality and global inequality. So for me, the profession of economics, if you were to take it from a macro level, its predominant focus should be on econ global economic convergence. Uh, in the way that we have in the pandemic, no one's going to get out of this until we're all out of it. As long as the virus continues somewhere in the world, it's going to be a threat to everyone. Yeah. As long as poverty and inequality, you know, very severe inequality and, and severe poverty are in places in other parts of the world, it's going to give rise to extremism. It's going to give rise to huge human suffering. Yeah. So for me, and going back to the idea of the, the morality or immorality of economics, yeah, that's something that the current framing, which isn't immoral, allows as an externality, or certainly doesn't take as its primary focus. Yeah. So I think convergence is an idea. Why is economics not focusing in an emergency situation as we are with a pandemic of making sure that we get economic thinking and systems and tools for having economic convergence, global economic convergence. I think the second one in terms of economists being held accountable for their ideas, I think we've touched on already, the idea of what counts as externalities. Um, and that is being challenged now, although it hasn't, you know, mainstream economics isn't, is beginning to bring it, take it on board. So the externalities of environment, but one I think that hasn't, maybe the pandemic is going to to sort of cause a bit of rethinking on this, but the externality of care. You know, it has turned out in the pandemic that, you know, that the, sorry, the essential workers who are by no means the best paid were actually turned out to be the most essential in society. But in many cases, they're externalities. Um, and then the third one, in terms of economic economists being held accountable for their ideas, we've touched on already. That what, what economics tells us about what it means to be human and what it is to live a good life. And I think it's much beyond material well-being. I, I, before the, our discussion, I looked up at the definition of, of capitalism. And it was that trade and enterprise are privately owned rather than state owned. That was the, the first definition that I, that I came across. Um, and in a sense, again, this comes back to, so the difficulties are that the, the partial understandings we get when we simply box things off into particular disciplines. Huh? Because whether things are state owned or whether they're, they're privately owned, and of course you've got a mix of those in, in virtually every economy. Um, doesn't really get to the fundamental question of what an economy is and what an economy is for. Yeah. And so if we talk about redefining capitalism, then 
it would have to bring into uh, into play questions like what is the place of capitalism or economics within broader social systems within the broader values of society and so I, I was also thinking you know, of course when we talk about going beyond capitalism you know are we are we in an era now with climate change and post growth you know that growth is pushing us to the destruction of the planet and i don't know the answer to this question but when of those movements that are there circular economy and you know, feminist economics and so forth which donut economics and so forth which one of them brings us which one of them is still within capitalism so for example the something that john Kay has written a huge amount about about the, the scale of financial capitalism you know, and you can imagine measures that bring financial capitalism back down to a, a fraction of what it currently is yeah you could imagine measures that tackle the the monopoly of global corporations you can imagine a lot of measures that bring capitalism back into more into accord with its relationship with democracy but it would still be capitalism yeah? and where do the arguments then but maybe now at, at this moment that isn't enough yeah? maybe all of those measures that are huge in our minds and in economists minds at the moment aren't enough because you're still using up the planet's resources and you're still allowing inequalities and so forth and so where does that argument where do the current ideas move beyond capitalism to a new you know relate new model of economics or a, a new relationship and I, I don't think it is again i'm going to connect this to the system not just economics it's a new model of economics and also a new relationship between economics and politics and gender and technology and other social systems you know? and, and to my mind i was just thinking I, I think we will have gone beyond capitalism whenever the wages of teachers or nurses are higher than those of investment bankers so i'm not sure we're there yet Given the answers to my previous questions, I'm tempted to give a one word answer to this, which is no. <laughs> but I think we in that, as I said, no system has continued in its current form. So the question, there is going to be you know, evolution. It, the question is, where is that evolution leading? And do it, does that evolution bring us into paths that, are, that bring us into to huge human suffering before we learn the lesson, as we did as in the, before the Second World War, and um, do we get levels of economics that economic or levels of inequality, and anger and rage, that the current paradigm of economics continues to justify, saying that nothing's wrong, we don't really need to change things too much, um, and does that bring us into levels of societal collapse and violence, before we can come out of it and learn that we need to have a a different accommodation between capitalism and society and so it, the system doesn't deserve to continue in its current form i think the, that's evidenced by the rage and the breakdown and the disaffection and and its impact on other systems particularly politics and um, so the question then is again to what extent does the economics profession contribute to the, the transition in a way that avoids the huge human suffering. In answering this question, I think we have to look back and, and look at the, the huge benefits that capitalism has brought. But in saying that, there's also an awareness of the of the enormous yeah, costs of that progress to date. So since the Industrial Revolution, there's no doubt that yeah, sections of humanity, large sections of humanity even, have made huge progress in terms of material standards of living, of health, in terms of our, you know, our, our knowledge, understanding, communication with one another, ability to travel, all sorts of things. Yeah that we've made huge, enormous gains. Um, 
I think we're at a stage in our in our development now. It, you know, it's almost like we've we're coming through adolescence now. Yeah, we've 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 grown up and we've got that level of material. Some of us have, as I say, it isn't it isn't evenly spread, and there are still large sections of, of humanity that are living in, in conditions of abject poverty. And I would say, abject, poverty in itself for Poverty in itself, in terms of, we usually think in terms of lack of material goods and hunger and so forth. And um, the single greatest impact of poverty on individuals is their exposure to violence, their exposure to exploitation. So absolute poverty is something that is a fundamental attack on the ability of individuals to lead lives free of violence and exploitation. Uh, and so there are these two, two sides of it. You know, there's the, the enormous progress and the enormous benefits that economics and capitalism have brought, have brought but there's also the, the huge downsides. And then we're coming up against this cliff edge, if you think of it in terms of the particular moment that we're in with climate change, but not only climate change, as I say, the breakdown of politics, the rise of authoritarianism. We are almost like in, you know, going back to, to very dangerous times that we saw that in the in the previous century. So and so I think the question again is how does capitalism, how does economics reform itself, gain a humility, if you like, you know, that it, like virtually every other science, including physics, you know, has partial truth that we are having to find our way towards the answers and find our way towards the answers at a time of extreme danger. And that in order to do that, we have to return to our roots. And returning to our roots means returning to values of empathy, of concern, of community, that we can get through this and find the way forward together. If we don't, as I say, then we unleash the forces of pathology and we will find ourselves in situations that we, I say, we, we have been in before and other parts of the world, unfortunately, are in. So this is a recurrent problem. Um, but economics has to take its responsibility seriously in terms of avoiding a further descent into, into chaos and violence. <laughs>